In the first part of this talk on Opsplinter, uh, I described how and why um, Opsplinter was formed. Um, and I described how by the end of October 77, uh, all uh, Zipra uh, infiltrations across the lake had apparently been stopped. Uh, but we didn't know that at the time. In November of that, of that year, uh, Splinter switched our strategy from uh, being defensive to offensive. We unofficially declared the entire lake uh, Rhodesian Territory at night, uh, at least for boat squadron. Uh, the police boats and police reserve boats were still required uh, to remain within Rhodesian, uh, Rhodesian waters. We'd realized we'd pretty much buttoned up uh, the top portion of the lake, the top 20 kilometers of the lake by Milabisi, um, with the installation of ground radar at Subungui uh, and a couple of uh, other boats with radar in that area. But we needed to know whether there were any other additional fast boats on the Zambian side that could allow uh, infiltration across wider portions of the lake. So we did an, uh, a reconnaissance uh, trip into Sinazongui Harbour, um, which is one of the big old harbours on the Zambian side. It was covert, uh, nighttime obviously. Um, we didn't see any sign of any fast boats that would have been capable uh, of outrunning our, our 24 footers. Um, we did find a 50 foot boat chained to a boy that we thought would make an, an excellent mothership if we could uh, lift it. Um, so we decided to exit quietly and come back a couple of nights later uh, with some bolt cutters to cut the, cut the chain off its pad, padlock and remove that boat. Um, we thought we'd slipped out of the harbour very quietly um, but it turns out we hadn't. The, our plan to lift that 50-foot boat uh, was, sky, was kiboshed further up the command train, which actually turned out was probably a good thing, because our quiet um, exit from the, from the harbour was noticed, apparently, by Zambian troops. Uh, we got that from uh, radio intercepts shortly afterwards. Um, and as the, the harbour was uh, armed with a 12.7 uh, machine, heavy machine gun and a 75 millimeter recoilless rifle, perhaps it's just as well that we weren't allowed to go back in and uh, uh, a second time. Anyway, we were also ordered to carry out jitter patrols. Um, there had been something like six. Uh, rock, no, four rocket and mortar attacks on Kariba Township in the previous six months. Um, and the aim was to try and get the, te let the Zambians know that there would be consequences for letting um, attacks be launched from their own soil. Um, and also to try and get their troops, the Zambian troops, to be, force them to spread out and deploy along the, along the lake. Um, the jitter patrol consisted of either um, attacks on Zambian harbours or else just firing randomly along the, uh, the shore to force the, the Zambian troops to deploy uh, and to go investigate what, what was going on there. There was, there was always a shortage of, um, of boats to, available to us. Uh, so these jitter patrols usually consist of just a single boat or at the very most, two boats um, going in. We were given a remarkable uh, latitude, I guess, uh, in conducting these. We never needed to ask permission to do them from up the, chain, the command chain. The only request from uh, the OC of two independent in uh, INDEP company in, in Kariba was that we let him know if we were going right into Zambian harbours uh, that, that particular night. In hindsight, I guess there were probably uh, 
benefits and drawbacks to the Jetta Patrol. It seems to me that after the uh, after we started them, attacks on Kariba dropped in frequency. There were fewer of those. Um, but at the, on the downside, I suspect it probably made it a little bit harder for the SAS who were operating in that area of Zambia uh, at that time. And the increased alertness of the Zambian troops would not have helped their case. Anyway, about the time that we went on the offensive, uh, the SAS had moved into the other half of the Binga camp. Uh, you may remember from the from the previous part of my talk that um, the Binga camp was half splinter, occupied by Splinter and half by one of the uh, uh, infantry units. And at this stage, the SAS uh, moved into that other half. Uh, Captain Martin Pierce uh, got to know me uh, and the SAS started to use me um, to do drop-offs and pickups in Zambia. There were advantages of using boat squadron uh, boats rather than helicopters. They were far more uh, covert. Uh, we could go in pretty silently, uh, whereas a helicopter would always be noticed by somebody. Um, the other thing was there'd been almost been a, a friendly fire uh, incident on uh, the Zambezi River upstream of, of Lake Kariba when a uh, police patrol boat came across a Zodiac full of SAS um, infiltrating into Zambia. Um, fortunately, they managed to hold their fire just in time. Uh, but the SAS obviously realized at that time it was probably better to work uh, in close conjunction with uh, the boats rather than uh, independently. Now, I, I usually went into Zambia without a crew, um, and I always use call sign 22. Uh, call sign 22 <clears throat> was the only 24 footer we had um, without a cabin. So it had a very low profile, which was great for operating close into Zambian waters or up, up, uh, Zambian, uh, up Zambian rivers. Um, I had I did a very crude and horrible uh, spray painting job on call sign 22 with dark grey paint uh, to try and break up its outline to make it less visible when we went, went up rivers. Uh, it didn't have radar but I usually had night vision binoculars uh, which overcame that. That boat was the, the fastest boat we had and could actually, I think it was uh, measured at something like 95 kilometers an hour, could, could reach a maximum. Um, but that wasn't so important to me. What was important, it was uh, remarkably quiet. If you cut down to one, one engine and you lifted the other out drive, uh, you could idle in virtually silently. Uh, the exhaust was underwater and the engine compartment, like all of the 24-footers, was very well uh, soundproofed. So it was a great, great boat for covert work. Now most of those drop-offs and pickups I, I did for uh, the SES went, went easy and smoothly without any particular problems. But I did have one that didn't. Um, the aim was to drop a call sign about seven kilometers up the river uh, that empties into Sinazongui Harbor. Um, seven kilometers would have taken, taken us to very close to the bridge on the road that goes from, from Sinazongui to Mamba. Um, I don't know if there was ever the target of the SES. I never asked them their targets and I never asked their names. I worked strictly on the um, need to know type uh, basis. Now there was quite a bit of moonlight that night. Um, it's interesting how moonlight prom uh, figures so prominently in one's memories when you're dealing with, with night ops. Um, 
but I did the usual quiet approach, hugging the south side of Sinazongui Bay um, until I reached the, the river itself. Um, that river meanders across the flats towards the escarpment. Um, it passes mainly fields. Uh, there were a few um, small clusters of huts and single huts. I think actually in, in hindsight, probably a lot of those huts were, uh, were just for crop guards rather than permanent uh, accommodation. Anyway, they were all in darkness and they're all quiet. And I was ticking along maybe five kilometers inland. I had got to, uh, to the turnaround point yet. Uh, there was a distant dog barking occasionally, but otherwise it was quiet as anything. And then suddenly, uh, a loud drumming started right next to me, um, right next to the river. And then there was another one off to the other side. And then all around me, uh, the whole night was, was throbbing with drums uh, and people shouting. Um, it was kind of like something out of the, uh, a scene from Heart of Darkness or something. Anyway, the, the Zambian home guard was obviously working. Um, and very soon headlights came out from Sinazongui uh, behind us and started to head, head towards the river mouth uh, and cut off our, uh, our exit point. As the um, thing was already uh, compromised, the whole, the whole drop-off was compromised, we decided to call it a night. Uh, we turned around. Um, went back and re um, chose another spot for a couple of nights later to to reinsert the, uh, the the crew. Now, one of our favourite places as a launch point for insertions into Zambia uh, was Ruzirukuru Bay. Uh, it's just north of Chet Chetty Island. Uh, we'd lie up on the uh, on the island uh, during the day, so it was very secure. There was an old abandoned safari camp there, which made a, a great and very comfortable place to, to spend the, the day while you waited uh, to go in. There was an incident at Ruzi uh, that Andy Edmondson spoke about in his interview with Johannes, um, where an SAS member decided that he was going to go uh, spear fishing during the day while waiting to go across into Zambia. He was fairly dramatically uh, attacked by a croc. Um, he was fortunately rescued uh, from that, uh, but he ended up with quite severe bites on one of his arms and a few of his fingers was, was sticking back at, at weird, weird angles. So uh, he had to be Kazavex, um we had there was a float plane, a city float plane, but it was used for dropping off stores and and Kazavax if required. So it came in, picked up the guy, and took him back to Kariba. Now, either that night or a couple of nights later, I can't remember which it was. Um, I had to drop off drop off a four man um, SAS team. Upper River, about 30 kilometers northeast of uh, Sinazongui. So we left Ruzi Rukuru after dark as usual, uh, in call sign 22. I didn't have any crew again. Um, it was about 25 kilometers across the lake from Ruzi to the river mouth. Um, and as soon as we got in the river mouth, I could we could see ahead a campfire and when we looked at that campfire through binoculars uh, we could see uniformed people around it uh, and they were all armed. So we came to the conclusion it's probably a, a Zambian uh, uh, army patrol. Um, now the river there was probably less than 50, 50 meters wide but to take the crew to turn around and take the, the uh, SES team and drop them off uh, at a nearby place that, well, a place that I knew would probably have added another half hour to our trip. And it would have added another five kilometers or so um, to their walk-in. 
and they were afraid that they wouldn't reach their lie-up point um, before dawn. Uh, so the, we decided to try to get past the, the, the Ambien army. <clears throat> so I slipped past them on the other side of the river quite, quite satisfactorily, no problem. Um, and I was feeling pretty chuffed with myself uh, until about 100, 100 meters up the, up the river, I suddenly hit um, a fishing net uh, that is lying just just below the surface. I bounced, the whole boat sort of swayed and bounced to a halt. Um, it's not unusual to find, or wasn't unusual to find um, fishing nets up Zambian rivers, but normally they had floats along the top of the boat, along the top of the nets, um, so you could see them when you were in, in the water. Um, this one didn't have any of those. Normally they're just sort of plastic bottles or something to keep, keep the net uh, on the surface. Um, but I, lay, I stopped the motor, lay down on the engine covers and I, I felt down. I could feel the nylon net well and truly tangled around that prop. But the bad news was there was also a thin steel cable. Now I knew I could probably hack my way through the, uh, through the nylon net but the cable, I didn't have anything that would cut cut a steel cable. So I tried to get down onto the uh, out drives um, to see if I could untangle it and cut away the uh, the nylon uh, at least with a knife, and then unwind uh, this mess of cable. Uh, but I wasn't going to be able to do it from that position. So I took off my my webbing, um, lowered myself into this. Uh, inky black water, thinking the whole time about that that croc attack uh, a little while before, um, right up to my neck in the water and started sawing away at, at this net. Now there were a couple of problems with it. Uh, firstly, the, the net was full of bream and so as I was uh, chopping the net, I was also chopping up bream and bits of bream were uh, floating downstream as a nice croc chumming uh, stream, uh, letting any croc in the area know I was there. Uh, secondly, anyone who's fished for bream knows that they have very sharp pectoral sp spine or spines on their pectoral fins, uh, and these were stabbing my hands uh, while I was hacking away at them. Uh, so I was bleeding uh, quite profusely as well from my hands. And that was added to the croc chumming, uh, drifting downstream. Anyway, the other problem was because there was a slight um, current on the in the river, I had to use one arm to pull slack on the on the uh, net so that I could unwind the the cable or or cut away at the the nylon. Um, so I only had one hand to do the unwinding, which made it a lot harder. And I was in there for a while. It, it was probably about 10 minutes, seemed an awful lot longer, uh, but in the end of the I managed to do it, um, untangle the last one, last uh, circle of cable around that wedged itself between the prop and housing uh, and get out of there. Now while I had been in the water, the Zambian uh, army patrol had gone more quiet, uh, but soon after that they started talking again. Um, so I could uh, lower that out drive, start the motor, get a little bit of motion on the on the boat, lift the out drive, drift over the uh, cable, put it down in, and continue up upstream. And we went, as expected, probably one or two kilometers upstream of there uh, when the river became too, too shallow uh, and I had to unload the the SAS call sign and all their bogans. I don't know how those guys had carried those bogans. They're always incredibly heavy, uh, loaded down with all sorts of stuff. But anyway, so I, after unloading them, I turned the boat around <coughs> and headed back down, uh, downstream alone. The problem, of course, was that um, I couldn't get to the MAG in the front of the, sh uh, run the bow of the boat and I couldn't get to the uh, heavy machine gun, the um, 5 Browning, 
at, at the stern. Um, so I just had my FN, which made me a bit nervous, I must admit. Anyway, uh, the campfire had pretty much died down by the time I got back there. It looked to me as though everybody, all the, the Zambian army or whoever they were, were, were quiet and, and apparently asleep. So I just lifted the outdrive when I got to the cable, drifted over it, and slipped past the, 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 the camp uh, again, you know, without any problems. Uh, it was a real anti-climax. I'd uh, feared a one-sided um, contact with me just with one FN firing with one hand uh, while the other one con worked the boat controls. But none of that was necessary. So out onto the lake and then maybe 80 kilometers uh, back to Binga. I remember it was very, very cold uh, because I was, all my, uh, my clothes were wet. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a dark, a dark night to do it on, on just a compass and a sliver of moon. Anyway, Martin Pierce arranged a different uh, pickup uh, point a few nights later. And he and I went in, uh, guided by a single flash of the strobe light, to pick up the, the that call sign once they had finished their, their mission there. Now in April of 78, <coughs> uh, there were rumours that there were fast boats resuming zipper infiltration uh, from, the, from Chipepo. Chipepo is sort of on the Zambian side, almost opposite Boomi Hills. Um, the trouble was that Chipepo Harbour was hidden from the lake by a peninsula and a two to three kilometer long um, island. So we asked the Air Force uh, to take photos uh, of the harbour on the way back from one of their regular uh, reconnaissances of uh, Zambian uh, camps in uh, uh, Zipra camps in Zambia. So on the way back, they dog-legged through Chipepo and took took some photos. Now, as I recall, uh, those photos showed a bunch of small fishing boats, which we weren't particularly interested in. Um, but there were two bigger boats uh, moored alongside a jetty uh, in the main Chipepo harbour. Um, and those became um, a, a concern and a target for us. There was also a warehouse uh, next to that um, and a slipway and um, <clears throat> there's about an, a kilometre and a half or so from the Zambian camp so they weren't a, a major concern to us. So we uh, went in um, to try and deal with those boats. Captain uh, Sutcliffe was in charge of that operation. Uh, we borrowed four uh, SAS guys uh, who were uh, temporarily with us to help with a salvage operation. They were to provide and to operate a 60 mil mortar uh, and an RPG. We didn't have RPGs in our, uh, our armory at all. The operation was planned for Saturday the 22nd of April. Um, we wanted to catch the Zambians having a party and uh, not uh, paying any attention to what we were doing. As it turned out, uh, the weather was bad that day, so it was delayed for 24 hours until the Sunday. Um, we used the Ubiquay ferry um, as a floating base. Uh, I was the designated bang man, so I made up a, a satchel bombs on Ubiquay uh, using C4 plastic. We practiced some maneuvers off Kudu Island uh, on the way to the launch point and we were going to launch from somewhere near Paradise Island uh, to go in into Chipepo. And then on the Sunday night uh, on as planned we crossed with two or maybe three 24 footers. We seem to have a bit of a uh, difference of memory on, on that. Um, we left Ubiquay a couple of hours after, after it got dark. 
that night was a was a full moon, so it was very bright and very easy to uh, navigate our way in. I was on call sign two two uh, with Peter Sutcliffe. Uh, Corporal Roland Holden was our coxswain, and Sergeant uh, Gordon Holloway uh, was on the rear, the rear gun, the rear 5-0 uh, Browning. Two SAS guys also came with us with their with the RPG. Um, the other two went on the, on a second boat um, with the, with the mortar. We entered the harbour um, on silent mode through the little gap between the uh, the island and the head, headland. It's about a hundred meter wide or something like that. Um, we were dropped off. The other boat dropped off uh, the mortar team on the on the island and remained with them. Um, and our boat continued to the center of the bay. It's a pretty big bay. Um, <clears throat> so we were probably five or six hundred meters from the harbor. Uh, and we stopped there for a while to observe and do an OP on the harbour to, to see what we were going into. The boats were clearly visible um, with night vision binoculars and, and the full moon. Um, there seemed to be only one guard and he went to sleep uh, soon after we got there. Um, the army camp to the west, we were uh, to our right, uh, was quiet and and uh, no apparent threat from that side. We were about to move into the target when two sets of hired lights came snaking down the escarpment. We could see them uh, and heading towards Shepepe. So we, we held back for a while. <coughs> Those two trucks eventually made it to, um, to Shepepe uh, and went to the to the barracks. We, we could hear in the distance singing and, and, and shouting and so it was probably a portion of the, uh, the garrison who'd had the, the weekend off returning. Anyway, um, we waited until things went quiet again in the army camp. Uh, the guard was, uh, was still asleep so he wasn't a problem. And then we moved in. Um, Roland docked against the, the small floating jetty that was there. Um, I climbed onto the jet, to the first boat, um, target boat, placed the essential ch uh, charge there. Then I went to walked along to the second boat, uh, put the second one there. In I put both of them between the engines in the uh, near the rear of the of the boat, the stern. Um, then I linked the two with Cortex, put a debt and uh, short length of safety fuse into the first one. And we lit that fuse and then climbed back into the boat and disappeared. Um, we moved out maybe 200, 150 meters, something like that to uh, watch what was going to happen. And what happened was actually pretty impressive. It was uh, exceeded all our expectations. The uh, two charges going off with all the fuel in the boats provided a, a huge fireball. Um, I can remember the heat on our on our faces and bits of uh, boat cart wheeling up and splashing into the lake uh, not too far from us. Um, at the same time the RPG fired at the tank uh, that we had targeted. And the MAG, I opened up on the MAG and the heavy machine gun and the stern opened up with uh, Gordon Holloway. Uh, and on that signal, the SAS guys on the, on the uh, island fired their mortar. So there was an awful lot of noise and bang, banging and lights going on at, at the time. The tank that the RPG was fired at did not explode. So we think that it was probably a water tank rather than a fuel tank. And, um, but anyway, um, so we disappeared out into the, we headed out into the middle of the bay, watched it for a short while. The Zambian army responded with an awful lot of firing. Uh, tracer going out every single direction, mortars going off, 
uh, tracers spraying into the uh, hose, into the uh, night sky. Uh, I guess they must have thought they were under attack from the air or something. Uh, that firing was going every direction except towards us. Uh, we weren't receiving any fire from it. Anyway, so we drew out uh, from the bay. Um, we RV'd with the boat that had picked up the mortar crew uh, just outside that uh, the harbour area and uh, or the bay area and then headed back to Uberque, um, uh, which was waiting for us in, in Rhodesian waters. So that was that. In fact, if you, if you look at the satellite photos in 90, 2019, when the lake water was a lot lower than it was in 1978, uh, you can still see the um, craters from the explosions of those uh, demolition charges on the exposed lake bottom. It's uh, amazing to see that all this time later. Anyway, in June 78, two new uh, National Service um, subbies arrived from fresh from uh, School of Infantry. Um, they were going to be replaced uh, si Simon Todd and myself, uh, John Carlisle, who was the third subby who originally uh, came to Splinter, had uh, long since moved off to one of the uh, other engineers um, squadrons. <clears throat> but these two guys came and, and uh, prepared to uh, take over from us. I finished my national service 18 months in July uh, 78, uh, a month after these guys, uh, the new replacements had arrived. Um, a promised jo a exploration job uh, from Goldfields uh, that I was expecting to move into in Rhodesia had evaporated uh, in the intervening 18 months I'd been in the army. Uh, they had had to close down all their exploration uh, activities uh, in the country, unfortunately, due to the exploration, I mean, the security situation. Uh, they offered me a job in South Africa, uh, which I accepted with uh, very, very mixed feelings. And so I, I uh, headed, headed out and that was the end of my time at Splinter. But that was obviously not the end of all the action on the lake. <clears throat> and there are two other stories I'd like to uh, record here. Um, first one was boat squadron uh, strike boats were involved in an SAS hot extraction uh, two months or so later uh, in September. Um, that was about the time that the first Vicant was shot down by Zipra. An SAS call sign in Zambia required urgent uplift. Um, unfortunately, at that time, there were no helicopters available. I guess uh, a lot of them were uh, probably involved with the uh, follow-up to the zip to the uh, Viscount uh, Downing. <coughs> but two uh, boat squadron twenty-four footers were requested to extract the SAS t uh, team from the location that we'd, we'd used previously. Uh, Corporal John Blair uh, was on the second of those two call signs um, and he uh, described what had happened. Uh, the strike boats arrived at the agreed pickup point shortly after dark. Um, the second boat had a number of D, D squadron, it's the first time we'd, I believe, we'd operated with D squadron SES um, on board to act as muscle. <coughs> um, the strike boats, um, the first one was cocked by uh, Sergeant Dave Haig, um, and that was used for the actual pickup itself. And the second uh, strike craft held back behind uh, to provide cover. But un unfortunately, Zipra or the Zambian army had got there ahead of the boats um, and they ambushed them, 
opening fire on both boats just as the SAS were boarding the, the pickup boat. Uh, it was a very dark night apparently um, and the boat in front, the pickup boat, had merged with the land mass uh, in the dark so the, the boat that was hanging, the second one that was holding back behind, couldn't provide the, uh, the firepower uh, covering fire that was required because they didn't want to hit the, the lead boat. Um, <clears throat> anyway, as the uh, lead boat was pulling out under fire, um, they hit some more fishing nets, similar way to what I had done um, up that river earlier. Um, the Cox, um, Dave Haig, just managed to avoid uh, being hit uh, as he was bending down at that moment to call for backup from the, the second boat, uh, a round pass through his windscreen just where about head height. So he was he was very fortunate in that in that score. His crew member jumped into the water under fire um, to try and uh, disentangle that prop. He succeeded in untangling or partially to untangling at least one of those props <clears throat> and the boat managed to limp out of the killing ground um, just on one motor. Unfortunately, um, during the pickup, a couple of the SAS uh, guys had been hit um, by the by the fire from the, the ambushing group, whoever they were. Um, and that was, that was certainly a very tragic outcome to that, uh, that uplift in hot extraction. A month later, uh, in October 78, uh, a number of the boat squadron boats assisted the SAS by taking them in uh, with their clapper canoes and dropping them off just outside Simazongui Harbour. Um, the SAS then kayaked in to the harbour, um, laid charges on a number of the boats in there and des destroyed those. Uh, they also apparently uplifted a barge and somehow got that out of the harbour area um, as well. That operation, <coughs> or a very similar form of it, was repeated uh, three nights later in uh, Chipepo Harbour. Uh, again, uh, boat squadron boats dropped them off, SAS off uh, immediately outside the, the Bay Area and the SAS went in, did their demolitions on the boats and returned to be uh, picked up again by the, by the boat squadron. As far as we know, uh, there were no high-speed boats uh, discovered during either of those um, SAS raids into Chipepe and uh, Sinazangui. Um, and that would appear to confirm our feeling that all infiltration uh, across Kariba by Zipra had been previously choked off. Now the last story I'd talk about is uh, the boat squadron's support for the SAS's Operation Bastille, uh, which was the attack on Nkomo's headquarters in Lusaka. That took place six months later, uh, in April 1979. Everyone knows uh, that the SAS crossed into Zambia with old Sabre uh, land cruisers uh, disguised as Zambian troops. The boat squadron played three parts. Uh, Firstly, it crewed the ferry that went in and took the SAS across the lake and dropped them in Zambia with, their, with the, the land, cruise, uh, land drovers. Um, <clears throat> secondly, they provided stri uh, strike craft support and protection for the, land, uh, for the uh, landing craft, the ferry, uh, while it was in Zambian waters and uh, while I was waiting in Zambia for the return of the SAS. And thirdly, they undertook a, a simultaneous um, diversionary raid on Chipepo uh, to distract the Zambians from the SAS operation. So look into those a little bit more detail. The <coughs> boat squadron's ferry, Ubuque, 
was undergoing maintenance at the time. Um, and the civilian uh, sea lion ferry was used instead. Uh, you might recall that the sea lion ferry was the ferry that was ambushed as it was going through uh, Chetty Gorge in December 76. Uh, so I guess this was a good payback in some way. Um, all the sea lions um, crew had been replaced by boat squadron crew, uh, except for the skipper of the of the uh, of the ferry. Um, the protection boats, the, there were four of them, the strike boats that uh, provided protection to that ferry. Um, one of them uh, went with the ferry to Wafa Wafa. Uh, at the start of the operation to load the, the Sabre Land Rovers and the SAS uh, team that was going to be doing the operation. Uh, they then sailed on the afternoon of the 12th of April um, across to Sampa Karuma Island, just off the Zambian shore. Um, and then there they were joined by three other boats, uh, strike boats, and they all went in to Zambia uh, late on the afternoon of the 12th. <coughs> they landed the, the vehicles and the SAS team on the Zambian shore uh, and waited there for them for a moment before returning back behind Santa Karuma Island to spend the night uh, with a view to picking them up, the SAS up in the morning after their operation. As soon as they got back to Santa Karuma, however, that evening, uh, one of the boats headed uh, south and hightailed it to uh, Paradise Island where they met up with a, B a BSAP boat and two police reserve wing boats and all four of them then headed across after dark to Chupepo <coughs> and rev the, the foreshore. As I said, the idea was not to go in and do any damage. The idea was simply to provide a impressive light show uh, to distract the Zambians from the, the true purpose of what was going on uh, closer to on the route to uh, Lusaka. When they got back in the, mor in the morning, first after first light, the ferry went back in to Zambia uh, to be ready to pick up the, the uh, SAS call sign. Um, <clears throat> it turned out that they'd had a, uh, an incident and that they were delayed by a Kazavak, helicopter Kazavak, um, and also a couple of the vehicles were bogged down on the way out of Zambia, out of, uh, coming back from Lusaka. So they sat there and they waited, but around midday, um, a Zambian police boat uh, appeared from uh, on the scene and um, <coughs> came to investigate the ferry. One of the strike boats, uh, which was cocked by uh, Neil, Neil Potter, Sergeant Neil Potter, um, chased them off. They hightailed it at high speed to the nearest shore, <laughs> ran up the shore almost on the plane, uh, and the two uh, policemen in it gapped it inland and were, just weren't seen again. However, very close to where the, uh, the boat was uh, beached itself, there was a brick building uh, with a mast. And they were afraid that that might have been some sort of comms uh, back to Zambian police headquarters. Uh, so the ferry and their escorting boats then um, retired again behind Sampo Kuruma uh, Island uh, to wait for the SAS to come. <clears throat> they eventually turned up on the shore at about midday. Uh, the ferry was, went in, picked them and their vehicles up um, and returned under escort uh, back to Rhodesian waters without any problem. When they were when they left the the police Zambian police boat was still there, high and dry on the on the Zambian shore, and still no sign of uh, any of the policemen. So that was the end of uh, the Opera Steel involvement. <coughs>
Looking back at our uh, splinter, I have to think of what did it, was, did it achieve over that time. Um, it apparently successfully closed off and, and kept closed uh, more than 250 uh, kilometers of border with Zambia from any uh, Zipra infiltration. Not only that, it took the fight to Zipra with um, harbor attacks, jitter patrols, and dropping off and up, re uplifting uh, SAS call signs who are constantly harassing them. And now I've <coughs> spoken from the perspective of the engineer's boat squadron. Um, we have to remember that Op Splinter was more than that. Op Splinter included the BSAP boats, it included the police reserve marine wing and included some of the internal affairs boats and all of those played a, a major part uh, in, in Op Splinter, uh, a critical part even. Now I was only on the lake for, as I said, about 13, 13 months, um, but some of those boat crews, the boat engineer boats crews particularly, were on there for, for several years. Um, in unusually under-equipped, uh, in tiny uh, tiny boats that gave them no protection from either storms uh, or gunfire, and those guys have my uh, real uh, respect for the the time and effort that they spent doing that job. They really did, <clears throat> and so I just like to say thanks to you, Hannes uh, and John. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to tell some stories um, and I hope that perhaps have given uh, a glimpse of how we operated to people who previously knew very little about Splinter. Thanks very much.